Hey guys, it's Will. It's Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society. Welcome back to the channel. If you are new to the channel, welcome and thank you for finding us. I hope you are doing well. If you are not subscribed and you could subscribe, it would be a huge help. I know I sound like a broken record, but it really does help to say that. I'm fixing my collar here. It's a little bent over. It doesn't really matter that much. It's an informal setting, right? We're just talking about movies. What are we talking about today? Blue Jean Monster. Oh, hell yes. Okay, so this is 88 films. This is a Region A and Region B release, so you can pick this up in either territory. This is an amazing slipcase. As you can see, it's like kind of reflective, and I really like this slipcase. It's really well made, too. Um, and uh, it's just, I think it's really, I really like the artwork, but I also, I really like the way in which it's printed. Uh, this is a batshit insane movie. This came out in 1991. It was released uh, in May of 1991. It ran in theaters from May 23rd to May 30th of 91. It was directed by Ivan Lai. And uh, Xing Fui On is in it, who you can see right there on the cover. These are my notes. And uh, <laughs> Pauline Wong is in it, who's in Mr. Vampire and Tragic Hero on Rich and Famous and stuff like that. So if you've seen, uh, if you saw like the Tragic Hero on Rich and Famous double feature from Eureka last year, then you'll be familiar with her. She's great in those movies. I really, really liked her performance in those films. She's very good in this film too. Gloria Yip is in it. Sewak Kit is in it. Jun Kunimura is in it, who's Japanese. He's in The Wailing. And he's in Hard Boiled, actually. He just plays like a, uh, like a triad in Hard Boiled. He's in like the opening tea house shootout, right? So you'll recognize his face from that. But he's amazing in The Wailing, if you've seen The Wailing. And I was, as soon as I saw his face, I was like, oh, shit, that's that guy from The Wailing. Um, yeah, so it's really, if you haven't seen that's a Korean film, that movie is freaking amazing. It is amazing. And Amy Yip has a cameo in this film. Um, so let me, I'm going to give you like two seconds on this movie, then I'll show off the physical release. I'll give you a synopsis of the plot, and then I'll get into my thoughts. I liked this movie way, way, way more than I thought I would. I did not, there was never a point at which I thought it was going to be a bad movie, right? I thought it was going to be like a trashy movie. If you know the setup of the film, basically this, I'll tell you a longer version of the story, but essentially a cop gets turned into a monster. I thought it was going to be like kind of like a almost like Toxic Avenger style like trashy exploitation movie where he'd become a monster and then there'd be like whatever 80 minutes of him brutally murdering people and it would be over. This is a very it's a very good movie and it's a very strange movie. It's a very unique and bizarre film. It's very much of its time and I really liked it. Like I, I can't emphasize enough that like I really enjoyed this film and I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. So let me show you the here's the slipcase here. And then we pop that out. Uh, and the artwork, I should say, is by uh, James Neal. And you have the same cover there in this, the kind of like charcoal gray sort of translucent slim case that we get here from the 88 films has been using recently. And then we open that up and we see there's a poster there. There's no booklet with this one. Uh, but the poster is really cool because you get, it's uh, reversible. And so you get this artwork here. And then you flip it, and the Hong Kong artwork is actually uh, this way. I love this artwork, by the way. This Hong Kong artwork is amazing. And I'm going to do what I do, and I'm going to sniff it. Because I like the smell of paper. It occurred to me recently, do I like the smell of paper, or do I like the smell of ink? Because paper doesn't really smell like anything. So is what I'm actually smelling the ink, or is it the paper? If you know... Let me know in the comments. Also, let me know what you think about this film if you've seen it before and uh, what else you want 88 films to release and, I don't know, all that other fun stuff. And then uh, you get that artwork again here, as you can see. So uh, ooh, let me just put that back here. The plot of this movie is uh, – like on the surface, it's a pretty simple story. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by on the surface because it's – I think it's, it's deceptively intelligent and well written. Um, it's a simple movie. So Xing Fui On plays a cop. His wife is pregnant. That's her right there. And he goes to stop a bank robbery and gets really, really seriously injured. And he gets like kind of like trapped beneath a bunch of debris and stuff like that. And then through magical circumstance, uh, he is re reanimated, brought back. I don't, it's it's kind of unclear whether he dies because he has like an inner monologue. He can't move his body. So you're like, is he paralyzed or did he actually die and his spirit is like oh, self-aware, right? And I'm not really exactly sure what the deal is with that. But he becomes himself again, but almost with like superpowers basically. So he becomes kind of like this monster. 
And so he wants to – obviously wants to track down these bank robbers, right? And he also wants to help his wife have the baby. Like he's got drama in his personal life, but he's got this crime kind of plot of being a cop and wanting to stop these guys and stuff like that. So it's a pretty simple setup, right? And there's there was uh, – right away I was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of RoboCop, right? Because in RoboCop, they're trying to stop these bad guys and – RoboCop gets really, really brutally injured. You basically think he's dead. Then he comes back as this monster, and then he tries to track down these people while also having this kind of drama about his family life, right? This movie is much more of like an E.T. That's not, I know that's not a great comparison. That was like a kid's movie, but like a movie like The Gate, right? It's uh, Poltergeist. Like it's very much one of these 80s movies where it's like really kind of about – the tension that you can mine and the humor and the gross out and the violence and stuff you can get from the juxtaposition between like the banality of middle class 1980s life and, and like family life and stuff like that, right? And like work life and stuff like that. And these supernatural things like monsters and the crime element of like the bank robbers and stuff like that, right? So – I, what's really unexpected about this movie, to me, again, to me, because I didn't really know anything about this movie going into it, it's really not an exploitation film, which is really what I expected based on what I had read about it. It's a really intelligent and interesting and well-made movie because what they've done is essentially they think, okay, we set we set up this character. His wife is pregnant. It's their first kid. He really wants a son. You know, they want the baby to be healthy. And uh, he's got this guy who lives with him who uh, the setup is that he – He's, he's younger than them. I think he's probably like around 18 or 20. And uh, his dad died. I guess his dad was a criminal or maybe his dad was a cop. I don't exactly know what happened. But the dad died. And so the Shing Fui own character kind of like took him in. But he and the wife don't like each other. So there's like this kind of tension. But it's like – it's comedy though basically. One of the things that really surprised me about this movie is how funny it is. So basically this movie like sets up this character and this world and then turns him essentially into a monster and then is like – what would actually happen <laughs> if this guy was a monster, right? And like, but was still himself, like in his mind, but had all these powers. So like, the guy like goes to work. <laughs> He's like a monster. And there's this one scene that I think does a really good job of highlighting a lot of the great qualities of this film. He has to go and talk to his boss. And his boss is like, where the fuck have you been? Like, you disappeared from the crime scene. Now you're just here wearing sunglasses in the middle of the day. It's like bright as, like... In, my, in his office, right? It's like it's bright outside, fine. But like in my office, you're just like wearing your sunglasses, right? And like in a meeting, like take your sunglasses off when I'm talking to you. I'm the boss. So the guy takes his sunglasses off. But because he's this like monster, his eyes are really sensitive to light. So he has to like close his eyes. So he's trying to talk to his boss with his eyes closed. But but this is – see what I'm saying? This, this is deceptively intelligent filmmaking because – Instead of it just being like a stupid, haha, funny, couple moments, violence, sex, whatever, they're like, what would actually happen? And how can we place obstacles in the way of this character so that he has to overcome things going on this path to, uh, in his journey of the story, right? So it's like very good, like scene to scene writing. Like instead of him just getting yelled at by his boss or maybe not going back to work because he's turned into a monster, he's like, I guess, I guess I should go to work. And then he goes to work. <laughs> His boss is like yelling at him and his sunglasses thing. And then his boss dismisses him and he's, he closes the door to his boss's office. But now he's a monster. He's got like these superpowers. The door goes flying off the hinges, right? He's almost like Herman Munster. It's like this like befuddled. He's like this nice guy, right? He's kind of like a doofus, but he's like a nice guy. He's like this, this kind of like, oh, oh, oh. But he's like has these monster powers. And it's really interesting. And he gets like these really serious injuries at some point. So there's like disgusting makeup where it's like – there's there is one little sequence in particular that's almost like body horror that is just like so nasty and disgusting but like funny too. It's very funny. And there's a lot of like outlandish humor in this movie but the makeup is like really well done and like really gross and like very 80s. And like there's almost like this John Carpenter kind of sense of like stitching together as many genres as you can and just making like this totally outlandish batshit like original film that's very – again, I cannot emphasize enough how – interesting i thought this movie was because you it in a lot of scenes it's like a comedy or it's like a character driven movie about this guy anticipating the birth of his child and his wife's tension with his friend and how he tries to resolve that and then the the friend the kind of the kid he's taken in he's friends with a girl who was involved in the bank robbery like she was taken hostage by the robbers so the robbers are looking for her 
So he finds that out and tries to, like, help protect her. So you have, like, these little character triangles of all these people with these relationships to one another that build all of this tension and lock these characters into these relationships that, like, propel the movie forward while you get, like, all these really funny, like, gross out kind of moments. There, there's, there's a couple moments in this movie that are like, I don't want to tell you what they are and I don't want to put clips in here of them because you really should see them without knowing what it is. I think it's, like, it would be way more fun to just, like, discover it that are just like so like oh gross but like not in like an over-the-top brutal violent horrible way but more just like in a gross kind of like like fun 80s i know this is from 1991 but like fun 80s kind of horror movie vibe um i'm just looking at my notes here because there's a couple other things i wanted to mention the funny stuff the weird stuff it's just a very like weird movie like that's the best way to describe it it's a very funny weird movie but like the action scenes are really good there's a there's in particular there's two action scenes that really stood out to me as being really well done, like good shootouts, good like chases and stuff like that. But the comedy is really well done. Right. The other thing I really wanted to mention here that I think is really interesting about this movie, because again, you hear the premise and you think it's kind of like this silly exploitation film. This movie has like a central theme and everything in the movie kind of revolves around and grows out of this theme, which is I, if I had to boil it down to one word, I would say it is essentially time, right? This is about a guy who's anticipating the birth of his first child. So it's about getting older, becoming a father, the responsibility of that, what it, what that means in terms of the passage of time and the passage of knowledge from generation to generation and stuff like that, right? It changes in your life and stuff like that. There's a birthday scene in here. I don't think that's an accident that they celebrate his birthday because he's become this monster, and he's kind of like undead. He's almost like a zombie in a way, right? And so he is now literally staring death in the face. Like at any moment, like his magical undead ability could wear off for all he knows and he could just drop dead. But he wants to be there for the birth of his son, but he's becoming acutely aware of his own mortality and of the fragility of life. And 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 there's he's provided with the opportunity to protect the people around him in a way that he's been – kind of not really asked to do before because his life has been relatively comfortable. So he's called to to take on a greater sense of responsibility as a protector, right, which is like becoming a father, right? So it's this really interesting thematic thing that exists at the core of this movie that I think like a lesser film of this nature would not have and I just think speaks to the insight and the intelligence and the abilities of the filmmakers here, which is I should also say the writer is Ingam Hung. Um, so him and Ivan Lai as the director, like they're – I think it's a far more thoughtful film than I anticipated it to be and that I think a casual observer might give it credit for. Um, there's an interview on here with Sam Long, which is 21 minutes long. He was the assistant director on this film and he worked a lot with Ivan Lai and it is a fascinating interview. This dude was born in Macau. He developed uh, a love of Japanese cinema. He loved uh, Shoei Imamura and he loved Kurosawa. He went to study film in Japan. So one of the things that he talks about that I thought was so interesting and Jun you know, Kunimura who's in this film is um, – he is Japanese and he and, – and so this this guy talks about like how he kind of pushed to hire that actor and he thought it would be interesting to have like a Japanese actor on the set and stuff like that. He talks about the differences between being on a set in Japan versus Hong Kong and how Japanese actors and filmmakers and stuff like that are very, very different from the – the actors, pr filmmakers, kind of crew and stuff like that in Hong Kong and what, what that difference is. I thought that was fascinating. Um, he talks about working with Ivan Lai. He talks about the script situations. You know, like a lot of people talk about how they didn't really have scripts for these movies in Hong Kong. And he actually talks quite a bit about that and how sometimes it would be like really messy and difficult on these films because you had so little information about what the story was that you were like constantly on the verge of like the whole thing just falling apart and making no sense. And a lot of people talk about that like, oh, yeah, it's just how we worked and we didn't have scripts. But like he – it's interesting to hear his perspective of like <laughs> it's kind of like a disaster in a way of like we were constantly just like like is this thing going to even make any freaking sense at all and it's just it's interesting to hear that alternate perspective on it rather than this kind of like shrugging thing of like yeah this is how we worked he was kind of like yeah it was kind of it was kind of uh nerve-wracking to be working without any sense of what the story was um other than like a very basic outline I think that's a pretty good overview of my thoughts on this film. But, like, this really surprised me, and I really enjoyed it. And it's been a great 2024 for me so far for 
Hong Kong cinema, I loved When Taekwondo Strikes, which you'll know if you watch my review of it. I really, really enjoyed this film. I'm really excited for what's coming ahead. Uh, Inspector Wears Skirts, I have that in as well from 88 Films, so I will be reviewing that pretty soon. Um, what's the, the, I can't remember the name of it, The Man from San Francisco? Is that the Chuck Norris uh, Eureka movie? So a review of that is coming soon. Lots of good stuff coming up. I thank you so much for watching. My name is Will. This is Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society, and we will see you next time.